caveat, we believe 38,000 of them to be recoverable, the remainder being deep water at sea losses. I'll talk about this later, but our limit right now in terms of underwater recoveries, which we do do, is 250 feet right now, but that's changing with new technology. And so the fullest possible counting is simply leaving no stone unturned. It begins with historical research, and I'm glad you began your academic career with military history. So I think you can appreciate that history and research really drives what our scientists are able to do. Because obviously we can't search an entire country, but if historical research can narrow it down to a smaller area, then we will send the field investigation team. They will hopefully narrow it down to this. And if we get to this, then we will send an archeologist, anthropologist led team with which to actually excavate looking for those human remains. If we do find them, they come back to one of two forensic laboratories in the world, the most prominent preeminent human skeletal lab in the world. Uh, it's a laboratory system that dates back to the mid eighties. And one is based at in Hawaii and the other based at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. And those scientists begin the laborious and time consuming work to hopefully put a name and a face to those set of remains. That's in a nutshell, the fullest possible accounting. So the agency needs to uh, balance a number of competing priorities, the safety of the folks that we're sending out to do the searches. Um, how do you think about um, those, those logistical challenges? It's a complex ballet, simply because it obviously begins with access. You know, these 45 countries we work in, uh, they weren't all created equal. Uh, some allies obviously readily uh, jumped on this and said, yes, we have, we believe we have a responsibility. Uh, the United States came to our aid in World War II in the Korean War. But there are also there are countries that are kind of looking at this and saying, uh, let's talk about this. And so over time, we have secured access to all 45 countries. There is one exception. I'll talk about that later. And so with the access comes again, that planning, that ability to have a case progress to the point where we actually can send teams boots on ground in the field to actually do the work, whether it's again, an investigation or a recovery. And with those field operations, as you mentioned, it is complex. We have operated at sub Himalayan altitudes. We have operated below uh, the ocean in Papua New Guinea. Uh, we've been on battlefields across Europe. We've been in Tunisia. And so it's this ballet of looking at resources, ensuring that we have cases that are executable. And by that, I mean, has the historian, the researcher progressed a case such that we can send a team to excavate at that point in time. And so again, it's, it's balancing that. It's obviously looking at weather windows. You know, we want to keep our team safe. It's obviously optimizing these, this operation as much as we can, whenever we can, and we do that through many subject matter experts. I would submit that among the 750 within the agency, it is the most eclectic organization I've been, ever been associated with simply because of the numerous skills, variety of skills that are all brought to bear. Yeah, so you operate also within the web of a really complex nexus within DOD um, and with broader parts of the interagency as well. Um, can you speak to us a bit about how you interact with other parts of the, the uniform side of this? So your previous position uh, at, at the, the joint POW-MIA um, agency and uh, through mortuary affairs, through the casualty notification and assistance uh, process. How, how does your organization fit in with all of that? Sure, so we are an element of the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, ergo Michelle Flournoy, where she first served as uh, the Under Secretary for Policy. And as a policy arm, you know, one, I often get asked the question, well, that doesn't make sense. Why aren't you in personnel and recovery, PNR? because of mortuary affairs. And the answer simply is because of the element of us being a tool of engagement, a humanitarian effort that the department, our state department partners utilize in again, creating access to and strengthening a partnership, strengthening an alliance. That's where we fit in terms of the overall DOD structure. 
We obviously can't do this alone. So first and foremost, we work with four combatant commands, four geographic combatant commands, who provide us augmented specialists, whether they be explosive ordnance disposal technicians, medics, linguists. And then within the department, we don't do DNA analysis. Uh, there, the department has an incredibly adept, incredibly just world-renowned uh, Armed Forces Medical Examiner System, Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory that is by far the cutting edge in terms of DNA analysis. And they do that on behalf of us. They come under Defense Health Agency. And then you mentioned the services. So when we identify a service member, we are not the ones that notify the family. It is the four serve, five serve, six, sorry. Although I, I don't think we have a, yet a space command uh, or space force uh, MIA, but that could be. So among the services, we notify the services, they in turn connect with the family. They are the primary means of communication. They present the identification report, and then they will go through the mortuary affairs tasks that are associated with that as if the service member passed away last month. Burial, benefits, all the things that go along with mortuary affairs. And so it's a partnership arrangement within the department itself. And then because of the 45 nations that we work in, we are very much connected to the Department of State here in Washington as well as every single one of those 45 U.S. embassies, simply because, again, as a tool of engagement for our U.S. ambassador, it's something that, again, resonates not just with the U.S. country team, but also with the populace in that country. Yeah, so speak a little bit more about the diplomatic side of things. There's certainly the country-to-country -country interaction, but there's also the engagement of the teams on the ground with the local community. Absolutely. Uh, when we send teams, whether they be an investigation team or a recovery team, it's usually a small team, uh, anywhere from 8 to 15, 20 people at the max. And so depending upon the complexity of the site, we could employ up to 100 local nationals. And these are villagers that come. A lot of these sites are remote. These are villagers that come from far and wide to descend upon the site and help the team with the labor that's associated with that particular excavation. And excavations can range anywhere from 45 to 60 days. It's that people to people contact that I think every single US ambassador, US embassy appreciates simply because we are projecting American values in a positive way. And more importantly, for many of these cultures, many of these citizens, it's an opportunity to give back Probably the best example I can give you, and I never knew this, throughout Oceania, this is the South Pacific, Papua New Guinea, Palau, Solomon Islands, they revere births, they revere marriage, they especially revere death. And so when they hear of our teams coming into their village to look for what they call our grandfathers, it's an amazing dynamic. Some of our team leaders, these are captains, uh, master sergeants, are made tribal chiefs, which I think is a incredible dynamic in that people to people contact. And again, obviously we benefit from the support from the federal government in that particular country, but it's also a means of projecting soft power in terms of American values at the local and regional level. So there's also been a number of scientific and technological advancements in the last 20 years that are aiding in the work of the DPAA. Can you talk a bit about what those technological and scientific advantages are? Do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> First of all, let me talk about our partners at the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System, mm -hmm. cutting edge DNA. In fact, they have patented techniques that are just unrivaled in the world. What used to be a large piece of bone that they would need to extract DNA from literally can be done with a tiny piece of as big as your, your fingernail on your uh, pinky. They've also, because a lot of the unknowns that I've talked about were treated with formaldehyde when they were unidentifiable back after the war, whether it be World War II or the Korean War, that formaldehyde treatment, which was done to preserve the remains back then, 
destroys DNA. They have developed generation, next generation sequencing techniques that are absolutely incredible. What used to be a 5% success rate with treated, chemically treated remains, there are up to 62% of a success rate. And with that, we've been able to identify remains that we never thought we could because of the destroyed DNA. On our side of the ledger, our scientists, again, are world renowned. They have patented a number of techniques. I'll give you three that I think are, are very helpful. Dental remains remains probably the, the panacea of our seven lines of evidence that we use. Our forensic dentists, again, incredible. If they have a set of teeth that we have recovered, even a single tooth, they can work their magic. If we have dental records, dental x-rays, even paper dental records with which to compare it against. But the three techniques that I think are important to share with you and your audience is the fact that our scientists patented a what we call chest radiograph. I never knew this. Your clavicle, your collarbone is as unique as a fingerprint. Who knew? If we have the x-ray, which was done after, during the war when service members were inducted for, to, to check for tuberculosis, we have those x-rays digitized. If we find a clavicle in the field, our scientists will take a picture of that clavicle and we have developed this technique that literally takes 60,000 x-rays and based upon the picture will rank order the probability of that match being against that record. We just got it uh, approved, accredited as a line of evidence that we can use. Another one that we recently used was what we call isotope analysis. You are what you eat. I know we've heard that from our parents, but it's something that sticks in your bones for the rest of your life. Where did you grow up? I grew up in New York. <laughs> if we had your remains, we would take what we call isotope testing. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon in your bones are marked based upon what you ate and what you drank when you were a baby and when you were a toddler. And we have what we call isoscope, isoscope, isoscape maps that literally divide the country, divide the world as to where that isotope signature would be. And we can differentiate that your remains were associated with New York versus California versus Georgia. And so isotope testing really is an exciting, it, it can be done much quicker than DNA. It's much more economical DNA, and it allows us to take multiple possibilities and narrow it down to a smaller populace upon which we can then compare. And then lastly, our anthropologists utilize a number of techniques that have been tried and true over decades that they have refined in terms of establishing stature, in terms of identifying establishing race, gender, that they use in their physical analysis of those remains. So again, some, simply put, some of the unique techniques and technologies. Now on the recovery side, I think one thing that's very exciting, and I alluded earlier that our limit right now for underwater missions is about 200, 250 feet. We just partnered with the United States Navy they have an experimental diving unit out of Florida. We dove with them a site off of Papua New Guinea that was 800 feet deep. It was a B-24 with 11 crewmen that are still missing. Our divers, when they do dive, whether it's 50 feet, 200 feet, or what have you, are very limited in how much time they can spend on the bottom and how much time they have to decompress, and then more importantly, when they can get back in the water. With this capability, this is absolutely incredible, a bell that they have was, was able to put divers on the floor for, first of all, 15 straight days, followed by 22 straight days. Each diver had a high resolution camera that our underwater archaeologists above on the ship could direct them. And it was as if he were down at the bottom, 800 feet below, looking at this, this wreck. And they were able to finish that site 
an incredible amount of time such that we believe we found uh, a number of remains from that. We believe we found a number of personal effects, rings, dog tags, ID cards. It's an absolute incredible capability. And what's even more exciting is that we were told by the Navy that they've actually helped NOAA at sites that are 1,500 feet deep. So what that does is it opens up a number of aircraft ships, submarines that previously were, we were never able to get to. So some of the, the uh, those who are missing um, are from conflicts quite a bit of time ago. Um, and we don't always have even living family members left uh, from that individual. What's the process by finding the community to which they belong to? Right. So it it, be, it begins with the services, the military services, who have incredible genealogical services. So, for instance, when we say to the service, uh, we think we've progressed the case enough that we think uh, uh, Corporal Smith is here, then we will uh, work with them. They will then employ their genealogists who will find a family member. Fortunately, when it comes to DNA, we actually can go for Afdil, Afmes, Afdil can go four generations deep. So if we have a fourth generation family member that the service member has, and they give us their DNA, whether it's maternal or paternal, that is an absolute match. And so obviously, uh, if we need, we need something to compare it against. And so if we have biological records from the war, whether it be dental, whether it be the actual autopsy of when the uh, unknown remains were first looked at, then that becomes something that we can compare it against. When it comes to DNA, we've done very well with the current conflicts. Uh, for Vietnam, 89% of the missing, their family has a DNA on file. Korea, 94%. But because World War II is a nascent mission for DPAA and the department, it's only at 20%. And because this was something that Congress told us to proactively do in 2010, we're catching up as our historians and researchers build the cases with which to then hopefully excavate. So again, services do an incredible job with genealogy and the ability to find these families even after decades. We also have a unique partnership authority that Congress gave us when they established DPA in 2015. And that is the ability to authority to establish private partnerships. Mm. We have 120 of these currently in effect. These are universities, these are non-governmental organizations that bring tremendous capacity and capability to again, help us do this more, help us do this better, and help us do it faster. Uh, we just have, we just signed earlier this year an agreement with Ancestry.com to help us with genealogy. And what that arrangement does is it, through Ancestry's clients, their customers, they are notifying them that if they believe somewhere in their family tree that they have a missing service member from World War II or Korea or where have you, here's who to contact. And that would be the service casualty offices that would then secure the DNA and make contact with that family. It's fascinating and a great way to partner with things that civilians are already engaged with. Um, I want to remind our audience that you are welcome to submit questions uh, through the events portal, the cnas.org slash events, or using the hashtag CNAS2023. Um, as we're looking at the landscape of uh, potential future conflicts or, or even some of the, the um, thornier parts of, of current U.S. strategy, um, one case that comes up quite a bit is North Korea. So thinking about um, remains that may be left behind from the Korean War um, on, on, in North Korea, can you talk to us a bit about what the process is with remains we might believe are in North Korea? So I mentioned that we work in 45 countries. I mentioned there was one exception. You just named that exception. What's sad about this, this dilemma for us is the fact that of the 7,500 missing from the Korean War, 5,300 are in North Korea. In the early 90s, uh, North Korea turned over remains for five years in a row. Uh, they turned over what they said was 208 boxes 
Uh, it turned out to be, after DNA, DNA analysis, 700 individuals. Because of that five-year record of repatriations, remains repatriations, we, the United States, entered into annual joint recovery operations. This went on for 10 years, from 1996 to 2005. We actually sent teams, two teams, four times a year into North Korea. Uh, interestingly, North Korea would always say, you're limited to digging at Unsan and Chosen. And so for 10 years, eight times a year, we had teams on the ground working with the North Korean army. That stopped because of provocations, because of irresponsible behavior. And it wasn't until 2011, five years later, that North Korea unilaterally approached the United States and said, we'd like to resume those joint operations. We sent a negotiating team four times, uh, Beijing, Bangkok, Berlin, to negotiate that. We actually had a signed agreement. We were actually sending consumables. We were sending equipment, tents, shovels, vehicles, to North Korea to begin resume that work. They fire off a missile. Rightfully, the administration says, uh, we're gonna have to put a stop to this. Then you'll recall that in 2018, President Trump had that summit in Singapore with uh, Chairman Kim from the DPRK. That resulted in four commitments. We are the fourth commitment, and that is both the repatriation of remains North Korea is holding, as well as the resumption of joint operations. Shortly after that, North Korea unilaterally says, no conditions, come to North Korea, here are 55 boxes. We repatriated those. Those turned out to be 250 individuals. The bones had been out of the ground for decades, but all of them yielded, 501 bones to be exact, 250 different individuals. We have identified 88 from that, assemblage, and we have turned over 90 to our South Korean partners. So again, North Korea presents a great opportunity, but also a great challenge. It's a great opportunity from the standpoint that this humanitarian effort, as was conducted in the 90s and early 2000s, serves as a tool of diplomacy. It serves to build trust and confidence that might one day lead to better relations economic exchanges. I'll juxtapose this situation with Vietnam. 10 years after the war, Vietnam approached the United States. This is in the midst of economic sanctions, trade embargoes. Vietnam approached the United States and said, we want to cooperate with the United States because we know finding your missing Americans is something important to you. That predated normalization that President Clinton signed 10 years later. But it was that foundational building block that if you look at it today, this is when Vietnam had no reason with which to trust the United States to know that it was going to reduce economic sanctions, to reduce the trade embargo, but they did. And look at it today. Not only is Vietnam a prosperous, stable country, but it's a player in the region, if not the world. And all because they trusted the United States that by cooperating with MIA recoveries that they might one day, and here we are not right now in a, on, with a comprehensive partnership that we think will be elevated at some point in the near future. So thinking about all the different types of your workforce, it sounds like there's a rather diverse background of historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, sociologists, and then hard scientists. Um, how Can you tell us a bit more about the, the overall workforce and also how the agency goes about recruiting and retaining that very specific kind of expertise? Sure. So 750 individuals, uh, about 55% civilians, uh, you mentioned historians. Uh, we have a number of historians with PhDs. Uh, if this CNS thing doesn't work out for you, <laughs> give me a call. We would love to have you and your talents. Uh, you know, and then we have hard scientists, uh, anthropologists, archaeologists, and everything in between because the historians and the scientists obviously are on two ends of the spectrum. But this is a very linear function. And in between are logisticians, personnelists, finance individuals, a, a number of people that bring their skill sets to this equation. And so our recruiting, obviously, we benefit from the services because 45% of the workforce comes from all four services. We don't have any 
Coast Guardsmen, although we do use augmentees from the Coast Guard to help us with diving, di certain dives. Uh, in fact, we actually had a, the first Space Force Airman, uh, t technical sergeant, that she happened to be a, a, Lao, a Laos linguist, a Lao linguist. And so she helped us. But again, it was the first time that the Space Force actually participated in a DPA mission. And so obviously we get our military best and brightest from the services, and we're thankful for the services to giving us their best and brightest. And then for civilians, uh, you know, we're part of the DOD. And so, you know, we have job postings on USA jobs. We have volunteer opportunities. We have internship opportunities, all of which are on our website. And for many of our soft and hard sciences, our reputation and this being such a purposeful mission predates and is actually part of a postdoctoral discussion that that student might have. They know about DPAA and their colleagues, their predecessors, professors have all talked about this opportunity that if you can imagine for an archeologist, anthropologist, you're not just looking for antiquities, you're actually looking for someone to put a face and a name on and return to their family. So we all operate in resource constrained environments. Um, if, uh, if the agency were given either a bump in resources or a bump in, in your, your human capital, um, where would you invest that? Funny you should say that. <laughs> so when DPA was formed in 2015, we had operated at that budget, which was not really science because it was just the amalgamation of three organizations coming together, merging and bringing their respective budgets. But that level was capped uh, for almost eight years. Two years ago, we approached the department and said, 81,000, time is our biggest enemy. Witnesses are dying. Witnesses are losing their memory. Sites are being environmentally, environmentally degraded. We presented a case through a budget, uh, program budget uh, request. The department made good on, on it. It said, hey, this partnership thing has great promise. It allows you to build out your capacity. So they put a down payment of about one third of that budget program budget request in DPA's budget. And instead of saying no about the rest of the requests, they said, come back to us the next year and justify, validate, why and how you would use this money. And so we did that. Uh, we talked about the number of cases we would progress, the number of sites that we would close, the number of sessions into the lab that we would project. And atypical, you know, we're not, we're not the modernization, weapon system modernization, we're not readiness. And yet the department made good on the remaining one, two thirds. And so our budget in, 2022 went from 130 the primary previous year to 150 billion and next year FY24 it will go up to 190 million and that's cut that's put in place through the FIDET so it's not something that we need to go back and justify and so we're very excited about that and what that means is that we will be able to triple the number of operations in Southeast Asia in some cases, we quadrupling it. It means that we're able to bring aboard 16 new historians and researchers and a host of other things that allows us to be able to do more and to do it faster. That's great. And I think it, it highlights too, you know, you talk about the balance between modernizing weapon systems. Um, and that is a real priority for the department. But thinking about the priority that we place on this particular mission is incredibly important. And I think that the, the budgetary changes uh, demonstrate that. Um, so, now, by the way, Kate, yeah. before that, uh, Congress, this because this is a bipartisan issue, this is one that resonates in the halls of Congress simply because it's their constituents mm -hmm. who tell them, who tell their members why this is important to them. And so before the DOD increase to our budget, Congress was very uh, helpful. Uh, we would benefit from 25 to 30 million uh, program increases uh, each year for a four year period. And that again, went toward being able to do more in the field with what we have. 
That's great. And yeah, this is truly a bipartisan issue, both on the constituent side of things and also on, I think there's still a shared mission uh, and a shared sense of value when it comes to leaving no soldier or service member behind in a uh, foreign country. Um, so walk us through, if you are alerted that there might be a potential for remains in a particular location, can you walk us through what that process looks like from the time you're notified to the time that uh, the individual is um, returned back to their family? So when our teams are out there and, you know, whether it's uh, a foreign national that's helping us on the site or whether it's military or civilian personnel that's actually working the site for DPAA, uh, we pay attention to obviously, is there material evidence that might connect to correlating that particular site and that particular person? And then obviously we look for anything that might resemble what we call osseous material, human remains. There's always a very solemn repatriation ceremony that the host nation, both at the local, regional, and national level will conduct for with, with us uh, for that. Those remains will come back to one of two laboratories, as I mentioned. Everything from the Indo-Pacific region goes through our laboratory in Hawaii. Everything from Europe, Mediterranean, goes through our laboratory in Nebraska. They will then go through the painstaking process. And it could be short, as short as six months if it were uh, dental remains that were slam dunk, or it could be years. We just identified uh, last year a set of remains that came from those early 1990s turnovers from North Korea, just identified two bones from that. They weren't yielding DNA that matched a family reference sample in the database. And then because of the efforts of our laboratories, literally almost 28 years later, we identified those remains. And so again, once we identify an individual, then we will turn it over to the service. Uh, they will send an escort. Uh, sometimes a family will come with the escort to one of the two laboratories. They will take the remains back to wherever that family chose to inter them, and they will be afforded a full military honors burial. Even if it's just a single tooth, that individual would be given a full military honors burial. It's really an interesting dynamic that again is emblematic of our values, emblematic of how we treat our fallen and more importantly, how we treat the supreme sacrifice made on behalf of our nation. So this mission really does feel unique to the United States, but there are recovery efforts by other countries for their lost and fallen. Um, are there any we have any examples of how other countries have done this or how your agency interacts with other nations? By far, our most accomplished partner uh, in terms of the professionalism, talent, and expertise is the Republic of Korea. South Korea approached the United States almost seven, well, 20 years ago and said, you know, we still have 300,000 missing from the Korean War. Could you help us? And they are very, very fast, very accomplished learners. Uh, their laboratory rivals ours in terms of expertise. Uh, we have had joint scientific exchanges. We've had joint operations. In fact, last year, we had the very first joint South Korea American investigation in the DMZ on their side of the MDL, the military demarcation line. Vietnam has probably been our most, uh, our partner that we are very much wedded to from the standpoint that, again, it began in 1985. We just commemorated the 35th anniversary of joint operations. Over time, Vietnam has fielded teams that we have trained, that we have great confidence in. During COVID, when our teams were prevented from travel, Vietnam came to us and they said, look, you trust us, our teams can do this, let us, give us some cases and let us go do the work. 16 sites were excavated by these unilateral Vietnamese teams. Four of them yielded remains. To date, one of those remains has been identified. Navy Commander Paul Charvet. Here's what's great about this. He was a, a Sky Raider pilot shot down over North Vietnam. His 101 year old mother, Blanche, 
is still alive. You can imagine when she received the news that her son was coming home, what an incredible moment. But that was made possible because of the Vietnamese, American trained Vietnamese unilateral team that recovered those remains that we then identified. You know, in South Korea, we just uh, repatriated seven remains that we had found. In February, I was in Seoul, where I gratefully accepted a set of remains of an army soldier that they, their teams had found. So those are the only two countries that we have trust and confidence in that they can actually perform unilaterally the work that we do here in DPAA. So the work that you all do is really important from a policy perspective and an operational perspective, but I would imagine it's also personally hits home um, because this is such a moving process. Are there any stories or anecdotes from your experience, either in this position or in your two previous positions where you were uh, working a very similar portfolio that stand out? Do you have 10 hours? <laughs> <coughs> there, there are so many. I'll give you three from the three major conflicts. Uh, Corporal Luther Story was a 19-year-old from Americus, Georgia. Uh, fought in the Korean War, in fact, was lost a few months after hostilities broke out in September of 1950, the Battle of Noktong River. Uh, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. I, I find it mind-boggling. If you read his citation, to think that a country boy from Americus, Georgia, did what he did, 19 years old. It's absolutely incredible. Shortly after that battle, 11 sets of remains were recovered from the battlefield. Only eight could be identified. The other three could not be identified. They were buried as an unknown at the National Cemetery in Honolulu. We disinterred uh, three years ago and identified him earlier this year. This is absolutely incredible. So. His family were sharecroppers that worked on President Carter's family's farm. When we identified him, President Carter's folks told the president that Luther's story was coming home. And despite his health challenges, the word we got was the president got the biggest smile and said, I remember that boy. I remember his family. I am so glad he's coming home. You know, he was buried at Andersonville National Cemetery on Memorial Day. His niece is the only family member that's left. Her mother was Corporal Story's uh, younger sister. Just an incredible story. And then we found uh, the remains of uh, a World War II pilot, a B-24 bombardier, actually, who was lost over the raid in Ploesti, Romania. Uh, from that raid, it's the largest armada in the history of the United States. There were 88 bodies recovered from that, from that field and unable to be identified. They were all buried in France, French, American cemeteries in France and Belgium. We identified Lieutenant Peter Tempo from Michigan. Here's what's amazing is that of the 88 unknowns, we have already identified 54. Lieutenant Tempo, his remains were spread among three caskets. So in other words, he was part of three unknown sets of remains. The DNA that we used to collect, that we collected from him to identify him, actually came from a letter that his mother wrote to him, that our scientists at Athmes Afdil were able to extract DNA from that envelope and pull DNA that allowed us to make that identification. And then lastly, uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Sanford Finger, Lost in Vietnam, helicopter, uh, passenger on a helicopter, Chinook, that was lost uh, on their way back to Cameron Bay. Uh, over time, we have found remains, underwater remains. Do you know that when he was buried at Arlington, there was a young man with a wife and two children? Come to find out, Staff Sergeant Finger's niece put her DNA in 23andMe found out that she was related to this young man. This young man happened to be the son that Sarge, Staff Sergeant Finger had that he didn't know about mm -hmm. because he was born after his father died. And so coming to Arlington, this young man was the first time that he was reunited with a dad he never knew he had. And the dad reunited with the son he never knew he had. 
just three stories of what I can be, again, I can be here for 10 hours yeah. telling you all the stories. Yeah, no, that that's wonderful. And and I think it points to the utterly human part of war um, and what it means to, to the families uh, left behind. Um, so I want to tee you up to, to close us out with any parting thoughts that you have on where the agency goes from here um, or what you want the American public to know most about what it is that you do and, and why it is such a passion of yours. My message to the American public would be be proud of your country. Be proud of the fact that we, the United States of America, is still looking, still searching, still finding, still recovering, still identifying Americans who made, as President Lincoln said, the last full measure of devotion. And we do this on behalf of a grateful nation. And whenever we do find an American and bring them home, the community writ large all across the country, whether it's a big city or a small town, comes out in mass recognizing that sacrifice and recognizing that the United States is making good on a solemn promise, a moral obligation, in fact, a moral imperative, that we are here doing that work on behalf of this nation. I remember a lieutenant from World War II, Army Air Force's lieutenant, Ewart Sconiers, from Defuniac Springs, Florida. When he came home, Defuniac Springs population went from 500 to over 5,000 Americans, Floridians, neighboring states that came to pay their respects because their hometown hero, their hometown son was coming home. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us for today's discussion. It was really meaningful, again, from a policy and legislative perspective, but also from uh, the, the promise that we make to our service members, um, both living and those who've already passed. Um, we appreciate you taking the time. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in today. Um, you'll be able to access the, the video from this event uh, going forward. question.